Sweet. There we go. Hey, um, yeah, I was just saying, really exciting to have a chance to sit down with you. Over the course of probably the last six months on this show, for whatever reason, it's not necessarily created with the intention of being a, a health or food podcast, but it seems to have been a theme <laughs> over the last few months where the, the subject of food um, the subject of lifestyle, the subject of health just seems to continually come up and naturally um, in and around all of those subjects. It's it's hard to escape your face and what it is that you're doing, especially here in Australia. And um, I was trying to think of a, a really good launch point to the conversation because there's so many potential launch points. But <laughs> one, of the, one of the ones that I'm, I'm most interested in is the conversation around food. And so I thought perhaps... I'll hand the baton to you and I'll say maybe as a way introduction to everyone, you could tell us a little bit about how you actually found your way to where you are now, but particularly with reference to food, how did you find yourself in that corner of the world? Yeah, uh, it, it, I think it's an interesting story because because of what happened in my life and the choices that I made, it brought me to where I am right now, which is usually what happens in your life. But for me, I was a keen snow skier. Uh, I spent um, a whole uh, ski season at Falls Creek in Victoria uh, when I was 18 and 19. And I thought, I want to go to university, but I want to ski. Where can I go in the world that I can ski and go to university? So I found a university in America that was 20 minutes from the closest ski resort and it was called the University of, Co of Colorado in Boulder, Colorado. So I, I just thought, well, I'll pretend I'll do pre-med. I don't know what I want to do, but I'll go do pre-med, but I'll ski at the same time. And I was very fortunate. I was one Australian in 26,000 students and I was invited to Vail, Aspen, Winter Park, Breckenridge, Beaver Creek, you name it, I got invited to those ski resorts. So I got to ski the best resorts um, in the world, in the US, I guess. There's lots of good ones in Europe as well. And so I did pre-med and I was allowed electives. And one of the electives that I did was anthropology. And I did a whole year of anthropology um, right through to cultural anthropology and thought, oh, my gosh, it's the food that we've eaten our whole life, like our whole existence that gives us health. And this was the beginning of the 80s. This was the beginning of the dietary guidelines. Uh, and I had been brought up in a family that was very much about something called vitalism. And vitalism is where we look at the whole body. We look at the whole environment that the human lives in in order to be healthy. So I was brought up in that environment and food just seemed to be a, a part of that environment and my mum was a great cook she was from a farming family we only ate butter we only ate like good quality beef and eggs and she was very much into that type of cooking and yet the dietary guidelines were moving towards a grain-based diet so I thought oh I'm going to become a dietitian so I came back to Australia and gave up my skiing career and went to university at Deakin University, become a dietitian. And at the end of the my Bachelor of Science, which you have to do before you get your, it was a diploma back then, before I got my diploma of dietetics, I had to finish my Bachelor of Science. And as I'm doing it, I'm, I've got lecturers that sit on stools with big tummies, um, lecturers that didn't look healthy, and I'm being told the dietary guidelines, which were, you know, back then I think it was 11 servings of grain, low fat. It just didn't make any sense to me. And I thought I can't be a dietitian and go against per se the grain. So I went back to university to become a chiropractor. And so I did two years of chiropractic. And in that time I did human anatomy, um, pathology, um, histology, any, any parasitology, any ology you can think of I did in that two-year period <laughs> and at the end of it I went I love food I now understand that the food that we ate is what will make us healthy I'm just going to go out and beat my own drum and um, I quit chiropractic and started consulting as a nutritionist because you know I had my degree in nutrition so I started consulting as a nutritionist and taught uh, changing habits basically and going away from breakfast cereals and margarine and this is the 80s you got to remember this is the 1980s 
Um, and going back to real food, back to what we ate as hunter-gatherers, what we ate as ag- in the agricultural revolution, what we did as herding society. And, and I've been very fortunate. I married a very adventurous man. And we have travelled the world and gone and lived in places like the Seychelles and spent time in Africa and gone to where tribes still live their hunter-gatherer herding society and seen what they live on and see their health as opposed to the tribes that are closer to the bitumen and they're not living the life that that same tribe, you know, I'm thinking more the the Himbas in Namibia, Namibia, and where that same tribe is now eating vegetable oils and Maggi noodle soups and uh, grains and all those things as opposed to a very herding society, which was meat and dairy. So I guess it was that love of anthropology and cultural anthropology that living in a home of vitalism, that I just combined the two of those philosophies together, that historical perspective and vitalistic philosophy together, and I've done that for 45 years. I have not changed. It has not changed in any way. And I've seen diets come and go. I've seen darlings of supplements come and go. I've seen so many things happening, but I always go back to my roots. I go, would we have done this in our ancient time? And it is, is it vitalistic? So, yeah. you know, that's, that's that's the story of why I am here today, but it hasn't. It was a upbringing and a love of skiing. And uh, yeah. well answered. That's good. Hey, before I say anything else, I'm familiar. I've got a running background and I do a, an annual running camp up at Falls Creek. So there's oh. not much snow going on when we're there in December. But at the same time, that you can still make the most of some of those crazy trails. Um, I mean, it's the easiest part of the whole trip to organize is the scenery. And so the photos always look incredible. It's a great part of the world. This morning, I was actually speaking to a guy called Gordo Byrne, who's a ultra endurance athlete. He's a um, he's 55 and he's making a return to uh, Ironman. And he's based in Boulder in Colorado. And he was telling me about the trails and stuff that he hit over there. I've never been, but it's one place on my on my bucket list just for pure running reasons that I'd like to get to. So it looks like we've We've crossed a few of the same wow. trails um, in our time. I've still, I've still got a couple to tick off by the sound of it. Interesting to hear you, you speak about the, the move into the scene that you're in or in a strong way through the 80s because I was born in 87 and what was wild was for, for as long as I could remember, I was always relatively interested in eating healthy food. And from my perspective, my mum's perspective, who wasn't necessarily interested but was very supportive of me, it was, hey, let's have a look at what the professionals recommend as a healthy baseline for a healthy diet. And naturally, early 90s or mid 90s, I guess it was by this stage, I was sort of 10, 11, 12. I just fell into this world of just low fat, super high sugar, got the fillings to prove it, a couple of teeth taken out to prove it. And it was like a very early inkling of suspicion around, um, you know, whether it was government messaging or whether it was the confidence of a professional just to make me think, hang on a second, like if this is such a healthy diet and I'm, I'm, I'm so low fat and I'm, you know, doing what I'm told, it seems unnatural that I'm having such negative influences. And I, I think I was too young to really consider on my own what it was that I was doing. And it wasn't until I got a little bit older where I was like, oh my gosh, okay. So the, especially the last couple of years, I mean, you can go deep on this subject of messaging and the power of, of, of government's voice to persuade people towards whatever it is that they're trying to convince you of. But for me, the food one was really interesting. And, and I always noticed that anyone who had an approach to food in the way that you said, like quite a natural approach um, in the sense of, hey, it's what we've been doing for tens of thousands of years is just labelled a hippie and it's the end of conversation. <laughs> so what was it like through the 80s? Like I can imagine there's a lot that I've, I've probably thrown at you there that you've got plenty to comment on. But in the 80s, the, the response to what it was that you were coming out with, I'm, I'm sure you've been hippie uh, called a hippie more than once. Oh, I've been called more than a hippie, I can tell you. I, I, I <laughs> Me too. Yeah, it's, it, I was... I did nutrition. I, I practiced as a nutritionist right up until 89, 1989. And then I um, had my first child and we moved to Queensland. 
and I didn't have a practice and I felt like I wanted to do something with the knowledge I had. So I started writing for the local paper and I was the weekly columnist in the local paper for two years. The letters to the editor were incredible. They were either very supportive or I'm an idiot I'm a, a charlatan. You have no idea what you're talking about. I'll never forget when I wrote the article on margarine. So this is like 1990, maybe the beginning of 1991, I wrote an article on margarine and how bad it was and we should go back to butter. And and back then, you know, saturated fat was bad and polyunsaturated fats are good. And what blows me away at the moment is people still think that and yet it's been debunked over and over and over again. So I... Um, I did this article on margarine. Anyway, the Margarine Association of Australia contacted the paper and said that they wanted a retraction from what I'd said about margarine. And I just said to the paper, no, I'm not retracting it. I've got all the science. And margarine knows I have the science. So what they ended up doing to the paper is they said, we won't sue as long as you do a one-page spread on the benefits of margarine, which they did. That was the Sunshine Coast Daily. Then the last article I wrote was on artificial sweeteners. And my editor rings me and he says, Cindy, I can't. And these are the days when I typed it up and faxed it in. It just, I want your audience to understand this. This is typing up, faxing in. And he rings me and he goes, I can't um, print this. And I said, why can't you print it? And he said, well, I'll get sued by probably Coca-Cola or, or, you know, because of the diet sweeteners. And I, I said to him, you know what, I've been running for you for two years and if you're not prepared to tell the truth and you don't have the guts basically to tell the truth, then I, I don't want to be on your payroll anymore. And so I quit after two years of the, I did 100 articles and at the end of those 100 articles I went, there's a book in this and that's when I wrote my book Changing Habits, Changing Lives. But it was the letters to the editors that were very telling as to like there were medical doctors that would write in and saying margarine you know you shouldn't be debunking this and saturated fat's bad and and I, and I just thought how much nutrition have you had all you've got is propaganda and that's basically all human humanity seems to have on diet is propaganda by the food companies or by um, I, I've just, I'm in the middle of starting, well, I'm only just starting this book, but I've listened to a couple of his interviews and it's called Fiat Food. And it's all about the fiat currency and inflation and why the foods that we eat today, which are cheap and nasty and part of a agricultural revolution that is, is killing people, as opposed to our meat and eggs and, you know, the foods that we used to eat. Um, but, yeah, I just, the more I dig into food, the more I realise that we have to make a stand about the food that we consume because we are all powerful when we make a stand about the food that we consume um, because we are telling the market that we're not standing for your additives and your flavours and your colourings and your glyphosate that you're spraying on those grains that you're telling me to eat 11 serves of. But rather we're telling our local farmer that we're really happy with their eggs and their meat and their fruits and their vegetables and nuts and whatever else is available in your local area. So I'm, I'm all for making a stand in this world um, and food is my stand. And yeah. I hope I can get as many people on board because the more people we have on board, I think the more we are going to help our local community, number one, and, and, and then or ourselves, our health, um, but then the planet. So I've got a bit of an altruistic view on the food that I consume, but it's all based on vitalism and historical perspective. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, uh, I mentioned my mum before who I, I get on well with, like very well with, we're, we're best mates essentially. But the way we see the world is so incredibly different around things, like a number of, of things that you just mentioned. And I think a lot of it from what I can tell, and I'll tell you this because I think she would probably, she was being really honest with you, tell you the same thing. Because I think she finds a lot of comfort and security in what experts have to say about the world that we live in. And that doesn't matter whether you're talking about vaccine mandates. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about, um, you know, tobacco companies 60 years ago talking about the health benefits. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about, um, you know, big agriculture companies or, you know, the makers of glyphosate and paraquat who are telling you that there's no real evidence that 
this food is has any relation to negative health impacts like Parkinson's. So it's a lot easier, I think, to to really just say, okay, let's just trust the experts, not ask too many questions. And I mean, I found this out firsthand over the last couple of years, just through the through the vaccine requirements here in Australia. Like, I'm not sure for American listeners whether they fully understand what it was like here in Australia. Maybe very similar to Canada. Like there was a very top-down approach, a government approach to make sure that everyone had uh, the COVID vaccines, the one I'm referring to, obviously. Um, and if you asked any questions about it, then naturally you're an anti-vaxxer and you've got no interest in health. When I felt like the opposite was true for me. And it was the first time that I thought, okay, well, these are the experts that I've trusted with with my kids' vaccines in the past. I've never really asked any questions and for me, it had been a, a little bit of a whirlwind because the truth is, I, I think life would be a lot more comfortable if I could just continually hear these experts, the ones at Deakin University with the tummy talking about, you know, health regulation or uh, what's good for us and just trust it. But I, I, I think, I mean, you just have to scratch under the surface and see the rise in so many preventable diseases to go, okay, well, something's off. Like, I don't know exactly what it is, but someone's not telling the truth. And I mean, I look at the audience who follows your message. I, I saw a photo of about 50 or 60 people at one of the retreats you did at your camp last year. And I thought, well, everyone in that photo looks healthy. Like they look, <laughs> they're, they're tanned, they look fit, they're in shape. Just to look at this as an audience that I would, <laughs> I'm curious to, to find out more about. And I say all that, I guess, to ask, like, do you see that much? Do you, do you think much of the pushback to what it is that you're saying is a little bit rooted in fear of having to change the foundations that you've built your life on in a, in a lot of instances? Uh, th yes, it, that would be the pushback. And, and it would be easier to just go with the grain and, and do what they're all saying. But then in the end, it won't be because most people in Australia who live to 75 live their last 15 years sick and disabled almost. Or if they live a little bit longer, they'll live not good. Like you're a, a young, healthy man. I am a healthy woman. I don't take medications. There's very few people that can say what I say. And it's, and I, I, I kind of go, it's, I get told by doctors I'm lucky that I <laughs> don't need to take medications and that I've never had to take a medication and that um, I've never had a communicable disease because I, I've never, my father didn't, my dad was a pharmacist, I have to tell you. And he, back in those days in the 1960s, you got two vaccines, I think, as a child, but you walked to your vaccines, you did not get taken. So at the age of five or six, um, my dad would make us sit in the schoolroom and not go and get our vaccines, which were, was what it was. So I get told by doctors, that, oh, you're just lucky that you've never gotten this disease and you're just lucky that you don't take medications and you're just like, and I go, no, I'm not. It's good management. And I, and I brought my kids up the same way my parents brought our, us up, my siblings and myself up. And, I, um, and my children are bringing their children up exactly the same way. So it, if we're lucky, we're really lucky as, as a generational thing, like four generations of absolute luck. So the pushback is how I was brought up. I was brought up in a very, very odd family. <laughs> I can only say that because we were the only ones sitting there not getting the vaccine, and that was the 60s, you know. We were the only ones that our dad wouldn't give us Bongello or Panadol or Paracetamol or antibiotics, and that was just the beginning of those drugs. Um, and so I just know how I feel. I also know how if I'm not feeling a hundred percent. So let me give you an example. Um, when I was 50, probably around 50, I started to get, put weight on. I never put weight on in my life. I started to have aches and pains. Um, and somebody said to me, oh, that's just menopause. And I went, no, it's not. We're not meant to put up with this. There's something else happening in my body and I have to figure it out. Being a food girl, I went, it's food. So I did an elimination and I eliminated everything but meat and mm -hmm. above ground vegetables. That's all I ate. And I, I um, oh, and I did have a, poo, a few winter fruits as well. And I did that for three weeks. In the first week, I lost all my aches and pains and I lost four and a half kilos of weight. Now, you cannot lose four and a half kilos of fat weight. 
And the reason why I know this is that otherwise we would be a population of humans that didn't exist. We put weight on to survive a winter. We don't put weight on um, for any other reason but to survive winter. So if there's excess calories and excess energy, your body will go, hey, I can pack that away in a fat store so that when the winter comes, which did every year, the winter came, then I can use that fat store in order to survive. I don't know if anybody watched Alone. It was Alone, the Tasmanian Alone, yeah. and Gina. Gina put on 16 kilos to survive no food. So 16 kilos equates to 220 grams a day. Um, you will use, and that's 2,200 calories of fat that you will use in order to survive winter. And Gina did that. Gina just, oh, she was brilliant. She was absolutely brilliant what she did. So that's what our body will naturally do. We will just put on that weight. So um, I eliminated water weight. That's what I eliminated. It's like spraining your ankle. You get water on your ankle. It's about like 500 grams of water. You'll put that weight on. So I obviously had an all over um, inflammation in my body and my body was holding on to water. So in one week, I lost four and a half kilos of water and all my aches and pains. Something I was eating was causing the problem. And yet in one week, I had eliminated everything in seven days. I have to tell you, the first three days I slept, my body just would not allow me to stay awake. I would be in my office and my recept my one of the girls that I worked with, she'd find me on the couch asleep or I'd be in a yoga pose and I'd fall asleep. And my body just was going through this cleansing process. By the end of the three weeks, I'd lost uh, nine kilos. I never put that weight back on again because I figured out what the food was that was causing the problem. But then when I figured out what the food was that was causing the problem, I went, why? Why is a food that we've probably been eating for 17,000 plus years uh, creating a problem in my body? So then I went on to study that for two years and then created the documentary called What's with Wheat. And that's not weed, W-E-E-D, it's wheat. <laughs> a lot of people say well, of course there's a problem with weed, Cindy. And I went, no, wheat, wheat. <laughs> <laughs> so I created the documentary What's With Wheat and I, and that's when I learned about glyphosate and Parquat and, uh, as you mentioned, both of those and atrazine and and what when they were spraying it and how much was in our wheat and what it was doing to our microbiome and then what it was doing to health and my health particularly. So for everybody out there, everything is about me. It's all about me being the best that I can possibly be. And then when I find there's a problem, why is there a problem with me? It must be more than just me. It must be with other people as well. Then I go and research that and then I get excited about it and I write a book or do a documentary or create a course or whatever it is that I need to do, I don't know, in order to say, hey, guys, this is what I found out. Maybe this is affecting you as well. So that's that's basically, um, yeah, how luck works in my life <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is funny yeah, i've had that same conversation a lot of times people say it's it's good that you're in shape i said well i ran 15 k's this morning and you know i'm on the way to the gym and i'm watching what i eat and <laughs> i guess it's lucky that i know the knowledge but uh maybe it's not but it is yeah it, it's funny when you don't quite have the the insight that someone has you often just uh, attribute whatever it is that's causing their luck to to luck rather than habits which is something obviously that um that you've you've had a lot to say about when it comes to the wheat, like this is something that is a really interesting conversation. And I mean, I, I spoke to um, a nutritionist on here. I don't know if you know her, Lucia Rivas Herry. No, she's an Australian. She might. Be, she, I think she's actually based in in Queensland. But she's a a nutritionist, and she was speaking about this idea that uh, you know a lot of people say now that they're they're gluten intolerant. And she said, well, maybe, but I mean, like, what about? Why is no one speaking about glyphosate? Like, is this a response to something that's on our food rather than some of the, uh, I don't know. It's just become trendy in a lot of ways, in a lot of circles to, to request gluten-free when, yeah, when what's actually being sprayed on the food could be a bigger part of the problem. Like, I don't know if you want to speak to that a little more, but the whole conversation around glyphosate is, is one that's just blown me away. Well, uh, when I did all the study about the wheat, like I... Um, I start, I, like I, I listened to incredible people, read their books, you know, like Wheat Valley, um, 
Davis, Dr. Davis. I listened to Pearl Mata, who wrote Grain Brain. Um, I watched Natasha Campbell McBride, Vandina Shiva. Uh, there were so many people that I listened to and read and figured out what they were saying. And so when I started the documentary, I had a an idea of what it was going to be like. The last person I interviewed who I had also heard speak, um, she hadn't written a book, but I, I'd heard her speak, was a Dr. Stephanie Seneff, who's at MIT. She's a computer analyst, but she's a grandma as well. And she was noticing the rise in autism. And so she assumed it was one thing. And so she was researching it, but it didn't correlate. And she figured out where the correlation was, was glyphosate. And what glyphosate is, and, and by the way, when I interviewed her, my jaw was dropped the whole, however long I was with her, hours. I've got hours of her. And every time I ask her a question, she bring it straight back to glyphosate. Whereas everybody else that I'd asked the same questions to, they, they had different answers for, but she had brought it straight back to glyphosate. And so I was like, I thought, well, I might as well not ask any more questions. I know what her answer is going to be, <laughs> but she would explain it so well. I had to watch her video 15 times before I really got what she was saying because she was so knowledgeable and she'd written so many papers on it that she just laid out words at like she can make pathway and like, fructose intolerances and, and then, and, and then she would go, you know, and the shikame pathway and the aromatic amino acids and the folic acid. And, you know, she would, she would be so fast that it took me ages to go. I had it transcribed. I had everything done to understand it. That's the documentary changed from there. And it changed to do you have a gluten intolerance or do you have a glyphosate issue? And mm. what glyphosate does is it's an antibiotic. Um, it's it's a painted antibiotic. It's a painted um, chelating agent, so it takes minerals out of systems. It it has these patents that affect our microbiome and our mineral, the amount of minerals that we hold. And by affecting our microbiome, we're not making our aromatic amino acids that then um, are the precursors to our neurotransmitters, which means we don't think as well as we could think. Uh, and with the microbiome, we're not getting the folic acid that we need. We're not getting the B vitamins that we need. And and then we got fructose malabsorption. So then we think we need to go on FODMAPs. And I could go on and on and on. Like the knowledge that she taught me and she still continues to teach me. It's so funny. I, I still message her quite a lot and I go, what do you think this issue is? <laughs> She'll always bring it back to <laughs> biodiesel, glyphosate in the air, um, you know, the more we use wheat and corn and genetically modified food that has been sprayed with glyphosate, the more we're finding in our food supply, um, our children's microbiomes aren't working. And I believe this is why the carnivore diet has become so popular is because we can't tolerate plants. So we as humans, we use the dairy and the meat and the fish and the chicken that that's we use that our microbiome doesn't use that what our microbiome needs is plants fibers and you know celluloses and things like that that's what they need so if your microbiome isn't working you will not be able to tolerate plants and you'll have to only eat meats because that's all your body can tolerate as, as long as the bioweapon so i've heard whether i'm right or wrong that's got a that um, it's a tick that when you're affected by the tick, you become uh, allergic to red meat. And I've heard people um, talk about using the tick to get people off red meat. It's just, it, it, it's quite mind-blowing. And that's why I don't want to support those people. That's why I will not buy any foods that they have some resemblance with. So I will stay with my local farmer's market. I have my own farm now because I don't, 10 years ago when I did this documentary, I didn't trust what was happening in the food industry, especially when I went around the world with Vandana Shiva and Natasha Cameron. And I started to really get a grip of what was happening in the world of agriculture. So I said to my husband, we've got to buy a farm. We've got to start producing our own food, which is what we do. You know, we have credible fruit trees. We have cattle. We have chickens that deliver us eggs every day. Um, I have vegetables, garlics, gingers, flowers, um, 
and a haven, a haven for my family. So, um, and that's how I feel about what's happening. You know, I think everybody needs to start growing their own food. They don't need a farm. They can do it in their backyard just so you know the food that you're getting. I don't, I don't, I don't know if you know, but, like, when I started nutrition back in the 80s, all I had to do was get people off breakfast cereals and cheeses and get them on a real food diet. And, and that real food diet included bread, included meats and vegetables and fruits and nuts and seeds, no ultra-processed foods, and they got better. What's scary is that I will find somebody who will come and say to me, oh, I have this and this and this and this, and I'll say to them, um, all right, well, we can try the real food diet, but because they can't tolerate plants or they can't tolerate even dairy because their gut is in such a bad way um, that we have to eliminate just about everything before we can start reintroducing food back into the diet. So I'm 12 years on after giving up wheat, and I can now by accident might be some wheat in something and will not get a pain. It's taken me 12 years to get to that point. I don't deliberately do it. It might be just something um, and then someone will say, oh, that had a little bit of wheat in it, Cindy. <laughs> but I used to I used to always get sore backs and sore joints. Then I just got a sore finger. Then now I don't even get that anymore. So obviously I've repaired enough that my body can tolerate. Um, and th- And that's... You know, that's what we need to do. We need to get back to uh, where we can tolerate food again. It's so sad. Mm. Like I've seen 45 years of this and I've seen this progression, but it really started happening around 2000. So for the last two decades is when I really started to see people with gluten intolerances, dairy intolerances, lettuce intolerances. That, That blew my mind and I started to go, my people intolerant to lettuce. And then I found out that lettuces have this um, process done to it. It's not, they don't call it an ingredient, they call it a process. So you will not see it on the ingredient of your plastic lettuce, but it has something on it that absolutely sterilizes the lettuce completely. So when I pick lettuce from my garden at at the farm, there's a little bit of soil on it, I give a bit of a wash. But what's necessary for me to digest that lettuce are microbes, soil based microbes that help me digest the lettuce, help populate my microbiome, whereas we're sterilising everything. And by sterilising everything, we can't tolerate foods. So I know I said a lot there, but I just think it's time that we make a stand on on these things and maybe grow your own lettuces and tomatoes. They're easy. They're like weeds. (laughs) Herbs are like weeds. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I don't know. No, it was it was really well said. There's a there's a lot of good stuff in there. I don't know whether this is just my age and everyone goes through an a uh, like a phase like this with their friends. But hearing you speak about your farm and growing your own veggies, there, there's a lot of people in my life at the moment. As you were speaking, I, I reckon I thought of about five different groups of people who are all dead serious and keen about us going in together to get some form of land to do exactly what it is you're speaking about. And I'm, I, it's nice actually for me to hear you say about how you can just grow this stuff in your backyard. I'm looking out at my backyard now, which is tiny. And, I mean, we've got the cherry tomato plants and my wife's got a fig tree. <laughs> but that's the, that's the extent of what we got. We actually, unfortunately, we, we moved from a house with a monstrous backyard and I was sort of starting to go down the rabbit hole of what you were talking about. We had some chickens and we had some, you know, different fruits and things going on. Actually really inspired by Zach Bush. I, I read some of his Instagram posts and started with a compost in the backyard and from there just started to get the bug a, a little bit. but um have you noticed like there's been a, a real trend towards people being at least open to this farmyard or is that just the age that i'm going through people hit their late 30s and go you know what we should probably consider a farm <laughs> no i i think it's a real trend it's it, it's a it's a good trend and i hope people mm. do follow through on it because the more people that are growing their own food the the more the, the less likely are we are going to have food shortages. Um, at the end of the Second World War, and Zach Bush talks about it, they did victory gardens. Um, or during the Second World War, they did victory gardens. Everyone had to grow food in their backyard in order to feed themselves and the troops because the troops were men who were farmers who weren't now growing the food. So they they just got everybody in America to do that. Like my mum's American and, you know, her parents remember 
the Victory Gardens and they grew on two acres enough food to feed 13 people. They were incredible. You know, they knew how to do it. And so I think I think that trend is, is coming back and I think it's very important um, that that trend comes back because it, when we don't have or no, have the knowledge of the art of growing our own food, then we're going to be in big trouble. It's been a huge learning curve for me. And that picture of people that you saw at, it was last year, I did the Festival of Food and Farming. And it was to teach your age group to farm from a small plot to a big plot. So I had farmers with 60,000 acres and I had people there with one acre. So it was, yeah, that was that group of people. They were just, it was a four-day event that I did on my farm, 50 people only. I do it once a year and I bring in the most incredible speakers um, such as Charlie Arnott and Hamish McKay who do biodynamics and then we do natural sequence farming, which which is with Stuart Andrews. And then we also had some other speakers speaking on uh, you know, like permaculture or syntropic farms or regen or cell grazing or chicken husbandry. So we have all of those people speaking as well. And they were my son, Brogan O'Meara, and Rob Wyborn, who both work for me. So what we have achieved on our farm is a farm that people want to see because it's prolific in its production. You know, I, I, I produce more food than I can ever eat and you know, I, it just, it's like I just have an abundance all the time. And that's what you want. You want that abundance sitting there. Um, and I think it's good that your age group is starting that. Well, so my son's 30, was he 34? And he's the farmer. And he is, he's a builder. I bought the farm. I needed someone just to, you know, whip a snippet and do things. So I said, matey, will you go and do that? Let's have chickens. Let's, you know, we didn't know what we were doing. But now um, <laughs> I've sent him to so many uh, food growing co um, conferences. I'm actually, he and I are going to go to one soon and it's called uh, Subtle Energy. So if you ever get Charlie Arnott on, he talks about subtle energy. And I said to Charlie, what's subtle energy? I don't get it. I don't get it. Anyway, there's this conference uh, in March um, down in New South Wales and let me give you an example of what is happening in farming, in regen farming, which your age group will absolutely be blown away with. So um, it, let's just talk about running. <laughs> you know, when you run, you yeah. get on a high. It's, it's like, and you're out in nature, like the Falls Creek. Like I've hiked mm -hmm. Falls Creek, I've skied Falls Creek, I've cross country Falls Creek, I've hiked Hotham, I've hiked Feathertop, I've, I hike and I ski that whole area. I don't run it, by the way. I'm not a runner, I'm a hiker. So I put a backpack on my back and I'll just go out for days. This, there's this feeling you get, this, it's overwhelming, like it gives, brings tears to my eyes. It's you're out in nature, you're one with nature. You have an energy that just doesn't stop. Is that what I, do you experience that when you run? For sure. sure. For sure. I had a run this morning that fell into that category. <laughs> yeah. So there's something about it. It's the, the whole thing. So with subtle energy, it's the energy that's in the land that's giving you that feeling. And there's an example of a farm that was doing everything right, region, farming, everything was going right, yet they were doing everything right, but the land wasn't producing like it should have been producing. So this guy from America who's speaking in March came, came out and went to the land and he said, you've had a massacre on this land. We need to heal the land. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to clear whatever happened and when it happened. And history went back and they did find that there had been um, not good things happen on their land. The next year their, um, their harvest was 40% up. It just, just gives me goosebumps that we don't realise that food from land like that not only increases, but what is it, the energy, what is it giving to you? Not only to walk on it, but to eat the produce from it. So I've had my land cleared. I've had it, um, energy workers on it. Um, I had one energy worker say to me that I had um, 
spirits go through my land. <laughs> Um, but they were just passing through on their way through. So I, I don't know whether you believe in this or not, but there is energy out there that we don't know, with good, mm -hmm. bad, indifferent. Um, but once we clear that energy, our land starts to give us that feeling. And I think when you're out in nature in Falls Creek, especially in Hotham, I don't, I never, ever feel a bad feeling there. When I've got my skis on or I've got my cross countries on or I'm out hiking in the snow or even hiking in the middle of summer, there's just this something about it so um yeah the food that is grown on food on places like that where love and where energy and where respect is shown to animals and respect is shown to plants like every time I pick a food and, and I started doing it just because I was in awe I go oh sunshine and rain and I have a million limes on my tree you know, oh, like bananas growing out so many, you know, like, so I would start to go, whoa. And now I go, thank you. Thank mm. you. Thank you. And it just keeps producing. I've been away three months and I get home to my farm and it's like, Phew. it's like, oh my God, what happened? It's just, <laughs> it just grew so much. It just, the animals are happy. Um, yeah. It's just. It's, it's so interesting. I mean, I've got two, two points at the, at the tip of my tongue that I'll share with you just in regards to what you said. Like it, it's interesting just reading through the Old Testament in, in the Bible and hearing stories about the production of food on land and every seventh year they were instructed to let the land lie fallow. Like don't mm -hmm. touch, don't plant, don't harvest, just relax. Just let that take place. And uh, I guess you look at um, modern agriculture and how much it's just sort of torn apart in the name of producing more fruit fruit and vegetables and you look at the quality of the soil there and it's just a dust in so many instances it's it, it like it needs a, a little bit of time to to replenish but maybe more to the point to what you were saying I'm listening to a book at the moment called Into Thin Air and it's a book about a guy who actually goes to Ethiopia to train with the top Ethiopian runners in the world and so funny because I'd never heard this concept until you just uh, mentioned it then and I, I wouldn't have been able to remember this otherwise but what the Ethiopians do on a number of their runs is they go up to three and a half thousand meters altitude and apparently they've got a lot of eucalyptus trees in Ethiopia that had been brought over for whatever reason and you look at the the numbers around the speed that you can run at altitude and I mean it's it's severely limited these guys go up there they're running slower just due to the effects on their their respiratory system and the rest of their body but the bloke who wrote the book asked the question to one of their coaches why is it that they believe so heavily in this particular land to go and train at and he said well what ethiopians believe that no one really understands is that they go to these mountains to borrow energy and strength from the environment that they're running in so they said they have a genuine belief that when they're up there, the, the trees, the soil, the dirt actually inserts energy into their body that they can bring back down to sea level that helps them run at a faster pace. And I heard that and I thought, well, at the very least, like the psychological benefits of a belief system like that, I wasn't even really thinking about it literally. But I mean, when you actually think about that literally, it also makes sense. I I've totally relate to what you said about Falls Creek. I reckon we were there for five days this year. And I don't think I experienced any form of stress in five days. <laughs> you know, it was it, there, not only was there not much to do in between runs, but when you're out there running and you're, as you say, like you're, you're at one with nature, I mean, good luck being stressed in that environment, unless you fall off the side of a cliff, which none of us did. <laughs> but it's, a, it's a crazy experience. And I, I felt like I came home revitalized and rejuvenated and, um, yeah, it's a really interesting conversation. What was the guy's name that you said speaks speaks to it? I wrote the book about it. Oh, I, I, I'd have to look it up, but I think it's McInerney. Um, yeah, oh, yeah. I, I think it's McInerney, but I'll look that up and, and you can give it to your listeners. Um, he He's coming to Australia in March and I just want to listen to it. Like, I, It's funny when in farming, I slowly but surely I'm learning things and this is just another avenue of education that I want to learn but going back to what you said about the Ethiopians so we and Zach Bush talks about this we know that when we're in a under a giant tree fern or running let's say through Carnarvon Gorge where there's millions of giant tree ferns that those giant tree ferns are letting magnesium off and you are breathing in magnesium 
not only are they doing that, but there are la- there are spores that are being dropped onto you that you breathe in or you have on your hands and you might touch your face. You consume that and that helps your microbiome. We've got that transfer of oxygen and carbon dioxide between plants and us. When we ground, we have a and that's running with no shoes on or walking with no shoes on, when you ground or go into the water or go on the sand, you there's an ion um, uh, transfer between you and planet Earth that then feeds your mitochondria that then gives you ATP, which is your unit of energy. So the Ethiopians, you know, they live in a desert region, but if they go up to that, you know, up to the mountains, where the weather is cooler probably and there's a different ecosystem, they're probably borrowing the magnesium and the manganese and whatever other things because plants transfer minerals to us not only by consumption but when we run through a forest. Like my favourite thing is just going through different ecosystems and just seeing what happens with my health, you know, what happens to my energy. I can guarantee with 25 kilos on my back, and six days out in nature with no phone and just me and my girlfriends, because it's usually my girlfriends that go, and my daughter loves to come with me, that by the end of that six days, I just want to keep going. I don't want to stop. I've just got so much energy. The pack doesn't mean anything anymore. Um, I've slept on the ground. I've got dirt all over me. I've not had a shower, although, you know, when you're in Carnarvon Gorge, that's one of my favourite ecosystems to go to. you got lots of water. But, yeah, it's um, I, th- I think running uh, along a beach through a forest in the mountains at 4,000 metres, you know, like I just did a hike to 4,000 metres up a, in Guatemala, up a um, volcano that was erupting amazing that's if you want to look on my instagram oh i didn't put it i didn't put the volcano erupting it was yeah it's quite incredible it's an energy that but you know there are heavy metals in that that's the other thing there's heavy metals in it (laughs) and (laughs) and everyone's scared of heavy metals but if it wasn't for those minerals that are being spewed out by that they wouldn't be making chocolate and coffee or growing chocolate and coffee so, and the, and our body knows how to deal with those heavy metals. People get scared of them, but we know how to deal with them. It's when they're injected into us or um, we eat too much of it that we need to be careful of it. But for the most part, your body knows how to deal with them. For sure. Yeah, it's so true. Just to go back um, to, to put an exclamation mark on your point about just walking through nature. I don't know if you've ever walked the Camino de Santiago. No, it's one of my. I've I've, I've done the the um, Pyrenees and the in in Spain. I've done the Pyrenees, done the most incredible hikes in the Pyrenees, and I've done the uh, Sierra Nevadas in Spain. But I've never done the Camino. So yeah. yes, it's uh, it's on my bucket list. Uh, awesome, awesome. Well, I've never done, done the ones that you mentioned. Yeah, we we did. <laughs> My wife and I in 2017, we did the, we did 300 kilometers of it. We were just sort of dipping our toes in the water, but um, I mean, 300 Ks over two weeks. But, but what uh, we experienced a lot was after about three or four days of walking, exactly what you said, we didn't want it to stop. And I remember just being on the walk and being like, I don't think I've ever felt this relaxed in my life. Like it was just an unbelievable experience. I've actually, I've got two boys. I've got a three-year-old and a one-year-old. And I'm, I'm going to take them through like from the age of 13 to 18, like a, an initiation into manhood, essentially. And for the graduation, uh, when they turn 18, I'm, I'm going to take both of them separate times and, and do the Camino with them as a like a, a, a final kind of point in the, um, you know, the initiation or for lack of a better term. Do you know what I'm trying to say? And so that's how sort of significant and powerful it was in my life. I'd love to. I love to make that memory with them. My wife and I also want to go back and do it together. But yeah, you're right. It's it's something that when you, um, and I mean, I, I get stuck in this from time to time as well. I'm in a little small coastal town, but still get caught up in the the day to day grind of whatever it is that you're doing. And I mean, I've got the beach just around the corner, and sometimes I'm like, Tyce, you're stressed. What are you doing? Go for a swim. Like, <laughs> go for a, let your toes run through the sand a little bit. I always come back from that, like I do from any form of exercise, and feel better for it. Um, Cindy, one thing that I'm sure YouTube would absolutely just be hanging out to uh, use to take down an interview like this is is just a genuine curiosity from my point around the conversations of of vaccines, which I've mentioned a couple of times. Like, 
This is a conversation I'm so fascinated by, and, and, and it only became fascinated over the last couple of years when um, my wife and I, we both were like, all right, let's just see what happens with COVID. We're not, we weren't necessarily concerned. We had a lot of family in America when people were freaking out here who had had it and they were fine. And we thought, well, we're fit and healthy. Like they're fine. We'll be fine, which turned out to be true. But I mean, I was a school teacher a, a few years ago. And as a result of not getting the COVID vaccine, you weren't allowed to teach here. And it just sort of sent me down the rabbit hole of asking questions. Like my older boy, I think he had two rounds of vaccines before we, we put a pause to that. My younger boy hasn't had any. And I'm just so mind blown at the controversy that comes with telling anyone that. Like, it's so interesting to me just to hear the response of friends and family. And so, so many people just think you've lost your mind. Um, but I mean, it's, you mentioned glyphosate as, as, um, you know, one of the, I think you did, I don't know if I'm putting words in your mouth, but we look at the rise in things like autism over autism. the years. And I mean, I've got no qualifications to actually be able to prove anything I'm saying. It's, it's purely me asking questions, but I'm curious about, like, it's unnatural that rates of autism just naturally go through the roof and maybe glyphosate and maybe um, vaccines. I've loved listening to RFK on this subject because he's just such a wealth of knowledge he's and he's got the references to be able to back up things that he says. But I guess my main concern with it all at the moment is it sounds as though those who are in favour of vaccines refuse to have a conversation with anyone who's just got questions about it. Like, I don't know if you saw Dr. Peter Hotez get offered like a million or, or I think it turned out to be more than that, just to go on Joe Rogan's podcast and have a chat with Dr. Peter McCullough. I and he's like, no, no, you, you, I don't engage with people like that because it gives them credibility. And I go, well, no, it's just, there's people like me who are genuinely curious. And if vaccines is, is the way to go, let me vaccinate my kids. But if it's not, like, let me know that too. And so, like, how do you go with that conversation? Because you say it calmly and relaxed, and I'm getting to that point now. But for a long time, I was almost embarrassed to admit I had any questions around that topic. Yeah. Well, like, you know, like my dad was way ahead back in the 60s. He just said no. That blew my mind what you said about your dad before as well. Yeah, yeah I, I couldn't believe that. He was a pharmacist, you said. And, and he was, was a pharmacist. Already there. Um, yeah. he, he was a pharmacist who, and I think this is a good story to tell, he was in Wellington um, or Lower Hutt, somewhere around there, and he was a pharmacist and he would give scripts. And the only people he was giving scripts to were the 70 and 80-year-olds. That young people didn't need scripts. And one day he was walking down the street and this um, gentleman who he used to give Pepto-Bismo to, um, he ran into him and he said, well, why are you not coming in to get your Pepto-Bismo, which is for indigestion? And he goes, oh, the quack up the road helped me. And he goes, who's the quack up the road? And he goes, the <laughs> chiropractor. And so my dad got interested. My dad is someone who questions everything and he got interested and he went to see this guy called Cecil Phelps. And dad quit pharmacy straight away, started working as a carpenter and saved enough money in 10 months and flew to the America to become a chiropractor in 1957, I think it was, 57, 58. That's where he learned, went from mechanism, which is food is um, all mechanistic. It's like we look at the calories, the proteins, the fats and the saturated fat or whatever, and we'd say whether it's good or bad. We don't look at margarine versus butter, butter being a vitalistic food, margarine being a mechanistic food where we've manipulated the polyunsaturates, we've manipulated everything in order to make it look like it's good, but it's not. It's not healthy. It looks like food, tastes like food, smells like food, but isn't food. It's a plastic thing that never goes off. So he learned that in the human body. He learned that he, as a pharmacist, was looking at things mechanistically. You got indigestion, take your Pepto-Bismo. But if you've got indigestion, what is it that you're eating? What's happening with your, you know, your high, do you have a hiatus hernia and so on? So he learned about this vitalism. And that was where, when we were born, you know, we were his guinea pigs. <laughs> basically <laughs> you know like i'm 63 and i've never had a medication not one antibiotic not nothing gee um and i've had four broken bones and he just said you deal with the pain this is your way of dealing with pain understanding what pain is all about these days what do we do 
your pain's bad, give you a give you a pill. He wouldn't give us anything. No matter what happened to us, we weren't allowed anything. So um, I guess when I then became a mother in the 80s, <laughs> uh, the late 80s and early 90s, and I went to my play group, people would question me, why do you not vaccinate your children? And I, I would give them that, that the human body is an innate intelligence, give it the right resources and it will be the best it can be. And that would be, and back in those days there wasn't that um, angst that there seems to be now about it. Like they, they just, it, there seems to be this real fighting about it. I remember one girl though who was, she was always worried about me and my kids because we weren't vaccinated. And the saddest thing happened. Um, her son was vaccinated at 16 months and he died 24 hours later. And she came to me three months later. Like we were there with her looking at because she was part of my playgroup. She was one of my friends. She always was a little bit, she thought I was a bit of a witch, a bit of a, you know, a hippie, a bit voodoo, doo doo. And she came to me and she said, I know what killed my son and I'm not doing this again and I'm pregnant. What do I do? And so I said, I'll tell you what, let's get, and so I'm not the expert. I might know a lot, but I'm not the expert. And so I said to her, let's get this lady that's written this book, A Chemical Assault on Our Children. Let's bring her to the Sunshine Coast and let's do a talk. Then you will get the information and so will all our friends. And that's what we did. We got 175 people at the Marichidor RSL to come and listen to this woman speak who was probably one of the first writers on a chemical assault on our children, which was on the vaccine issue. And and she she just chose not to, to do it again. And, of course, through COVID she was a pillar of strength, you know, for her whole family about what was happening. So for me... Um, I just say, why don't you read the book? Why don't you read mm. it? You know, this is my story. It could be your story. Um, it's up to you whether you choose to do that or not. And and I'm not, um, you know, I'm 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 not. I'm an, I'm a real advocate for food, but when it comes to vaccines, I do what I think is right for my children, and no one will tell me how to. Uh, what I have to do to my children in order for them to be helped. So I was a mother bear, a very, very big mother bear, and I'm that way with my grandchildren too. And my kids have learnt and they know and they've got partners that have also come on board with us only because I don't advocate it. You do what you want. Here's a book. Read the book. And you make your own decisions. And you know, RFK, I, I just adore him and what he's doing and what he's standing up for and how he risks his his life. I was reading something in the paper yesterday. They didn't even talk about RFK as a potential presidential runner. This is an Australian paper. And I'm like going, you're talking about Biden and Trump. You've forgotten that Kennedy has a huge part of the vote under the age of 35. You know, and, and he wants to get the health of hum, humans back. You know, he talks about the 1986 Act where all vaccine manufacturers, back then in 1986, they weren't, we weren't getting many vaccines. Then he talks about the 1986 Act where all vaccine manufacturers were given total um, immunity if anything happened to anybody that was vaccinated. So that makes me think well, what's happening? I was already thinking, but that, make, that I would think that that would make me think. And I think the whole COVID um, mandation of the vaccine made a lot of other people think. And then I don't think there's anybody that doesn't know somebody that was injured by this vaccine. They're saying one in 800. That's the stats. If you listen to Ed Dowd, mm. there's another guy that's um, doing some stats in the U.S., um, and they're saying it's one in 800. And if you look at the New Zealand stats, that guy that is the whistleblower in New Zealand and he's showing what what injuries or deaths have happened and it's one in 800, they pulled thalidomide long before that. They pulled, you know, Vioxx now. They've pulled, um, they're now looking at oxycodone as, you know, what it's doing. And I don't understand why. And I think people are kind of going, 
Well, if that if that's what's happening, it's it's about you being questioning and, and not taking everything at fact. And I think that that's what my dad taught me was to question everything. Mm. And I question even the carnival diet, the vegan diet, the, the the fiat diet, the fiat food. The so I'm questioning all the time, and I'm inquiring. And if you don't question and you don't inquire, then you're going to go down the ro- the route of mandations being told what to do um the the who in may world health organization in may are going to take over legislation in australia for when there is a pandemic on and have people thought about this so i hope your listeners are questioners don't take anything i say as fact nothing Question everything. Go out and do your research. And it's not easy on Google. You you know, like you can, I was listening to, oh, I was listening to Dark Horse. Uh, is it Dark Horse? Dark oh, Horse. Yeah. Like, like I just love him, um, the both of them. And they were talking about polyunsaturated fats, cholesterol, and, of course, that's my love, you know, all about this. And she said, I pretended that I wasn't me and I went on Google and I typed in polyunsaturated fats and health. I could not find anything about saturated fats being healthy or cholesterol being healthy. It was all about, so it's skewed for you not to find that information. So then you have to seek out that information yourself and you have to listen to podcasts like yours, like what I do, what, you know, and all these things. You have to seek out alternative media because it's not in mainstream. Like I'm always tagging mainstream media. Why are you not talking about the farmers in Germany that are going, are protesting because of this? Why are you not, you know, and I just I just always link them. Why are you not talking about this in Australia? This is going to happen here if we don't, if we, if we don't, yeah. But we know who yeah. pulls the purse strings in media. You just have to watch the advertising and you'll know who has all the purse <laughs> strings in media. Yeah, it's so true. I know I went down a rabbit Cindy, hole. Cindy, but... you're a lead. Yeah. Nah, hey, welcome, rabbit holes are uh, well and truly welcome and well and truly expected by the audience of this podcast. So you're in uh, you're in very familiar territory. But I told you an hour. I've got my eye on the clock. We've gone slightly over. So I'll love you and leave you. But hey, that was, uh, that was a whole heap of fun having you on. I really appreciate you uh, making the time to have a chat. Thank you. I, I loved it. You really brought up some good questions. And you know, I only get to talk about food and we talked about so many other things like agriculture and and health of our children. I think, you know, we've lost that health. Yeah, but thank you. Yeah, awesome. No worries. Thank you so much. All right, I'll leave you to it. I'll see you later, everybody.